ready to go live. Cool. We are live. Wow, we did it. Uh, hello. It was always our first sentence is we did it. Yep, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've done this a few times now, but we're still never sure. Yeah, <laughs> anything can happen. Anything can happen. Nothing is promised. Uh, Jocelyn, <laughs> oh, Jocelyn, Jocelyn's book came 15 minutes ago. So I guess you did not read the book in 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Um, the great anyway, news so, is that it will still be a fast read, as we'll talk about probably, um, yeah. which is great. So <laughs> you could conceivably finish the book by the time this conversation is done, if you are very fast. Uh, yeah, like very, <laughs> very fast. 3x uh, speed. <laughs> So the book in question, uh, we are discussing Ghosts in the Schoolyard. I don't know why it is so hard for me. I this is another thing that now keeps happening, but like I keep like I hold it up and I try to read the title. It's not backwards. It's perfectly like it's it's not being mirrored, but for some reason my brain assumes that it should be mirrored. Yeah. So I'm like trying to read it backwards, even though it isn't, I think yeah. is why. But anyway, the book that we're reading <laughs> is Ghosts in the Schoolyard. Racism in School Closings on Chicago's South Side by Eve L. Ewing. Um, introduce ourselves again, I guess, or oh, yeah. talk about the book first. I don't know. I'm Nicole Sweeney. I This is my YouTube channel that you're on. <laughs> and I am Taboki, and I am on Nicole's channel, but when I am not, I am on my channel at Okie Dokie Boki. Yes. Um, and uh, broadly speaking, um, I have background in sociology and communications and I make educational YouTube videos for a living. And my background is in biomedical engineering. And I guess I also help make educational YouTube videos, sometimes with Nicole. Sometimes Nicole helps me and tells me how to, how to say things. And then we educate people. It's very exciting. It's wild. Anyway, so uh, Ghosts from the Schoolyard <laughs> um, is uh, it explores school closings in Chicago, specifically in the Bronzeville neighborhood where Ewing had previously been a teacher. Uh, specifically, it's closings from like 2013 to 2016-ish, like they were announced in 2013. And so uh, the book spans a couple year period right around the time that Mayor Rahm Emanuel announced the closing of these schools um, through attendance at public hearings, attendance at protests, um, listening to transcripts, uh, interviews with people affected by the closing. So teachers, parents, um, students, Ewing explores both the city's arguments for the closures as well as the community response, um, first in terms of like protest and attendance at these hearings, and then later, particularly in the fourth chapter of the book, um, in terms of institutional mourning for the schools that were ultimately closed. Um, she talks a little bit about how this idea of mourning kind of emerged not out of her like research design. It was just something that came up in her interviews. Um, and yeah, that's that's what the book is, right? Did I leave out anything important? <laughs> I think that is. I, I'm, I think we'll get to the important parts. Yeah, but yeah, I think yeah. that is a very good broad overview of what the book is. Um, I've noticed that this is also based off of her doctoral research. Mm -hmm. Oh no, did I got? Okay, I'm back. You're cutting in and out. Um, uh -huh but I believe okay. what you were just saying and maybe everybody else heard it and maybe I'm the only one who it didn't cut out for it cut out for, but uh, yes, that this was part of her, her dissertation, her doctoral dissertation in, I forget now, but something pertaining to education, uh, sociology and education. So she described herself as a sociologist. Um, so yes, this was originally dissertation. I, before we, came on the recording was telling Deboki that I looked up her dissertation because I was kind of curious in what ways the formatting had changed, but I never actually got around to comparing. Um, but so yeah, so that that is a yeah. thing. Um, and for that reason, I will also say that if you read this book on audio rather than the physical copy, the narrator does not read the appendix but it is included in the bonus PDF with all the like tables and figures and stuff. Uh, and I would highly, highly recommend reading the appendix um, because I think that there is a ton of like really interesting stuff just in that, in the appendix in terms of how this research 
both in terms of how the research was conducted, um, but also there's just like additional, I think, terms and nuances and context for all of this mm -hmm. that I also think is really useful and worth reading and like strongly encourage, recommend yeah. to check that out. Yeah, and I think um, bringing up the fact that it's a dissertation um, to me is sort of important because like compared to some of the other nonfiction books we've talked about, this is definitely the most academic. Um, so both like sort of in its structure in like specific, like the broad structure within each chapter to the way that she lays out what her argument is going to be. She's not surprising you with anything. It's very academic in sense of like telling you ahead of time, this is what I'm going to be saying and then backing it up. Um, and then also as well with the methodologies, like having a clear description of the methodologies, why she's using it, um, and what that means in terms of her research, and also like in terms of what the weaknesses are too, which is always my favorite part of a paper, because I think that's super important like as part mm -hmm. of processing a lot of this stuff. Um, and the more transparent you are about that, the more useful your results actually can be. Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, I also think something, something else that is interesting about that in terms of just like the structure of this book is the way in which I think uh, again, like the, I feel like the other books that we have read up to this point have been much more narrative, or at least much more had a much more linear narrative. Um, mm -hmm. I think like, there is still a fair amount of narrative happening in this book, but it is far less linear. It is kind of circular in a way because it feels like she's essentially rehashing the same basic story in each of the four chapters but like yeah. focusing on something slightly different in each of those or, you know not slightly focusing on a different like um giving it a different sort of framing and a different lens uh and then kind of drawing on different history for going back over retreading the same ground of like you know these, these schools were closed here yeah. were the district's arguments um uh, so yeah, I think I think that yes, if you for that reason, it, this might read read very differently. I think from the but other we've read. also compellingly for an academic book, it is not dry at all, which is like unusual first of yeah. all, but also like really like this is like like we talked a little bit like we briefly mentioned this is like a relatively short book. It's like 150. 70 pages but it is both very efficient and also like very like it has like a core to it that like feels human that in a way that a lot of academic work often doesn't and that's something i'm curious about if you saw any, any difference between the dissertation and this or i mean it seems almost like that like a lot of that core i like like she's bringing a lot of herself to the work and like she she actually discusses that like she's talking about her own personal experiences she's talking about her connection to this fundamental story that's at the basis of it and like i'm curious if that is in the original academic work or if this is something that is a function of like turning it into a book and like being allowed but like yeah i don't know i i, I think i'm like really intrigued by the fact that this was a dissertation because it's it's i mean i'm not in sociology so i don't know what a normal sociology dissertation looks like um or even like a presentation or paper or anything so i don't know if that is i don't know like allowed in a way that is not often like part of the rhetoric in other fields that I'm more familiar with. So I, I again, just to be super clear, downloaded the, the her dissertation, have not, did not actually read it, did not do any actual comparison. So I, don't, I don't actually yeah. know that I personally yeah. can answer that question. Um, okay. Putting it out there that anybody else like that it was, it was freely available if you are interested. Uh, but I will say in like broader strokes without like making the, the direct one-to-one -one comparison here, I, would not be surprised if that tone were also present in the dissertation itself, especially because of mm -hmm. the way in which she talks about her research in the appendix, like that, the, mm -hmm. this idea of situating the self in social research is is like a thing uh, that like, like it's not- That's really interesting. You can't, like you're not, you, you can't be, um, I shouldn't say you can't be because you you also can try you can try to be like wholly removed that's also a thing um but like uh i think particularly given her background um she mentions this in the appendix that she actually so in in the, the main text of the book she talks about having taught at diet but she mentions in the appendix that she also uh taught at another one of the schools that was mm -hmm. actually closed so diet um i guess i maybe should have included up more of this in my my summary of the book uh so what the first of the the potential 
school, there's like over a hundred that were slated for closure. Not all of them were closed. So the first school that she like directly ties herself to is Diet High School, which was a school that she had taught at previously. And we follow kind of the, the community response and the protests and that school does not end up getting closed. That one ends up getting saved. Um, but there's another school that she taught at that is on the list of schools that got closed that she kind of that she deliberately omits um, from her research. And that actually is something that I, I would be curious to hear a little bit more about. Yeah. Uh, she kind of mentions that like part of why she omits it is her her tie to it. Um, and I would guess that that has something to do with like, so when she talks about, the way that she talks about the institutional mourning emerging from her conversations, and it's not in the appendix, includes a list of like her sort of like basic list of questions that she was asking her um, interview subjects, and none of them touch on this. And so it's, it was something that, that uh, participants brought into that conversation. And I would guess that like whatever personal relationships that she developed over the interviews were necessarily very different than the kind of intense personal relationships that she would have had with the teachers at this I yeah. believe it was an elementary school. So that that's like that's like the guess that I would hazard as to why she didn't do yeah. that. But anyway, sorry, that like got very far away from me. Going back to this thing about like the self uh being yeah. in the thing, right? So she is a black woman from Chicago who was a teacher at Chicago public schools. Like this this is intensely personal. And so um, it, uh, I would be, it would be weirder for in like contemporary sociology to try to create distance, to, yeah. like, to try to pretend that any of that is not true about her as the researcher. Um, yeah. That's, yeah, really long winded way of, <laughs> of yeah. getting to, I would guess that that is present, that that's like, that's like a thing probably in the dissertation as well as in the book. Like maybe there's ways in which probably like terms, I would guess that there's maybe a little bit less like terminology and like that the appendix, most of the contents of the appendix are probably longer and yeah. they're integrated more fully into the text. Yeah, they're but probably like, a chapter, like yeah. the first or second chapter. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but other than that, I, I would guess similar. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> I th I think especially um, again because this is like one of our more academic books. I've also I think a thing um, that I've been thinking about over the course of our series is like what is sociology? <laughs> um, which like <laughs> it would help if you know I don't know maybe if I watched <laughs> a series that someone had made about sociology and I could I could define that more more concretely. Um, but also <laughs> like these definitions are. <laughs> An extensive thing, um, and I, I think so. Part of part of, part of why this was super interesting to me is like so much of my field is rooted in its methodologies, um, and so that like talking about how she's using the interviews, um, how she's using um, the discourse analysis, like that was all super super interesting. Um, in terms of understanding a lot of the methods, like far beyond just like the scope of what the field is trying to study, like how you study the thing is such an important part of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, and like, and is because this book is more academic, we were able. Oh, sorry, you're cutting out again. Hello, oh, you are. I, I think I'm just hopping in and out. Okay, you are back. You are unfrozen, and I, I'm here. Yes. Cool. <laughs> yes. Um, I, yeah, I, I think the um. The, the methodology stuff is particularly interesting and is definitely a, a product of this being actually like much more fundamentally academic. Um, but like, I, I don't know, also is still something that I think like emerges in a, in like a different way. Like Dreamland was, it was written by a journalist and like uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned, I mentioned at the time that like I could feel the ways in, w in which it was written by a journalist, but like I had a hard time um, like explaining and uh, what precisely yeah. I meant by that. I I'm I am like glad now to have this like to have them both, you know. So I'm like like this th this is more like the kind of thing that in my head I I was expecting Dreamland to be. Yeah. Um. Uh, just because like I, without I did not know very much about the book before going into it. Like I just knew loosely what it was about. Yeah. I recommended a lot. Anyway. Um. 
I like that we're building up this library now of, of yeah. references and, and touchstones for this. Definitely. Um, yeah, even when we were talking about this too, like I this book, the last one, I feel like Dreamland has become my my touchstone of like things that are well, uh, unfortunately for Dreamland, but also this is a product of the book that it was. Like it has become sort of a touchstone for like refer referring back to things that I don't like in nonfiction now. Like mm -hmm. it's helping me to like kind of start to build the book vocabulary of how I want to talk about these books because like I think that's been a thing we've been figuring out too is like how do you review nonfiction books like both like the content of it and how it's put together and uh -huh. yeah yeah uh, yes we for a little like behind the scenes we do we do um i'm pretty sure we've mentioned this in every chat now but we we like talk the day before um and we have like an outline of sorts that deboki creates and it starts out like with a with like a clear structure and then devolves this one is particularly <laughs> bad but they're all pretty bad they all do this where like we're like having a chat and then we're also just kind of like here's an idea that i have and i'm <laughs> yeah. getting it um uh so we like we tr we're like trying to come into this with like here's an outline and like yeah. a structure um and then that never really it never really works that way uh but the methodology stuff i i guess i also found super super interesting i got really excited because the discourse analysis is like that was my jam mm -hmm. uh, do you want to do you want to explain it to people um yeah this will be new so yeah so discourse analysis um if you are just watching us talk about this book without having read it um she she defines it in in the text uh, on page 99. So if you're if you are reading the book, but basically it is looking at rhetoric, like uh, discourse, looking at, at discourse. The other, it's closely related to the other thing that I personally did a lot of was like content analysis. Super super mm -hmm. similar, but like so like for for some of the research that I was doing, like I was watching YouTube videos. And so I was, I wasn't, it wasn't just the words that were coming out of people's mouths. I was also looking for, um, like when I was studying Harry Potter fans, I was looking for props, like looking for stuff that they had. Like, like, and so like one of the things that I would code for was had merch, like had house, had house merch, huh. um, had like, you know, or not even necessarily merch, but like had objects representing an attachment to a Hogwarts house. Got and it. That was one of the things that I was looking for. Um, yeah. Discourse specifically, we're, we're talking just words, right? So like, this is literally just here are the words. And so you're analyzing um, like, uh, literally like what are the words that they are using and like to what effect. Um, critical discourse analysis more specifically is what she was doing. And that basically just means that it's looking at power structures. Um, and so she uses it most specifically when looking at statements by Chicago Public Schools and their representatives at public hearings and and like the, the ways in which the, um, the so there's a couple like long excerpts about why certain schools were closed and they have this very like stock quality to them of, you know, we ran the numbers and this school tested at 0.7 and this other school tested at negative 0.2. And so as you can see, the school that tested at negative 0.2 needs to be closed and the students will be sent to the school at a 0.7. Um, but it's a lot of like very dispassionate rhetoric, um, a lot of like, yeah, statistics and numbers, um, no explanation at any point, and, and this is something that Ewing says, no explanation at any point of like why any of those numbers matter, um, yep. why these these numbers really mean anything in terms of a school, like why does that negative point two uh, mean that the school deserves to be closed? I don't know, uh, like I understand that point yeah. seven is more than negative point two, but yeah. that, you haven't established <laughs> anything meaningful about that, but anyway. Yeah. Um, it's it's looking at the ways in which the words that people use <laughs> um, are are reifying power structures or de deconstructing power structures or what have you. Yep. So yeah. yeah, that section was like pretty. I remember like in my notes, like in the margins, um, one of those sections of just like they're dryly giving these numbers of like X has this percent, this has this other percent. Like I wrote, like this reminds me of, like a really bad seminar, like where it's just <laughs> very like dry and just like 
here is a number and here is a number, but like even a seminar is kind of generous because like, I think by the time you're giving seminars, like you should know enough to know not to do that. It's more like a really bad, like first year grad student talk of like, I ran an experiment, this is the number. And then like done, like that is <laughs> the assessment um, where like, and especially like when she's then looking at how people like from the community are responding. Um, it's a lot of like what you would then expect in a seminar challenging that first year, like being like, you know, like, how'd you pick those numbers? Why, like, what is your methods? Or like even more blatantly just calling them out and just being like, you're not explaining this like at all. So the dynamic like was very similar to that, but then like so much more fraught with these other power dynamics at play. Mm -hmm. Like a first year grad student is actually not the person in power. Like this is actually flipping that and using that like fake science-y kind of thing, like turning what in one case, like would just be bad science into an actual way to reinforce like racist policy. It was like mm -hmm. very, yeah, it was very cynical. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, all of the things that Chicago <laughs> public schools did. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of hope inspired a great deal yeah. of criticism. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so I guess maybe that's like a jumping off point to move past this, the methodology structure stuff mm -hmm. into maybe history, I guess. There's like a lot, yeah. there is, I, it is like wild to me that this book is, we have said this already, it bears repeating that this book is as short as it is because it is so dense, like there is so much to talk about uh, without feeling like it yeah. is. Um, and it's so fast at getting there. Like I feel, it felt like I read like five pages and then just learned like so much and was like, but it was like, all very like like it was very well laid out yeah i i, I don't want to spend too much more time like obsessing over how well written this book is <laughs> because and, like, we like get to like 45 minutes in and we're still just like obsessed with the the narrative structure when there's also like okay but it like it introduces the the there's like ca a cast of, a cast yeah. of characters uh yeah. right at the beginning you know like you're yeah. reading the <laughs> yep. very intense political intrigue. Yeah. Um, yeah, the third person was like, as of this writing, she was incarcerated in Alderson Federal Prison. Another one was like, abruptly resigned in 2016 to become an advisor for Airbnb. Like each of those is doing so much work. And you're just a like, lot, on there's the like a lot page. going on there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, in that quick, like two to three sentence summary of who this yeah. person is. Uh, so I guess well, actually maybe that is before, before the stuff that we have like noted in history is, is worth like quickly spelling out um, some of, because this is where she starts to is with a lot of this like terms and stuff. So Chicago Public Schools, um, the school board that runs the Chicago Public Schools, they are all mayoral appointees. They are not elected, uh, as is the case in like most places in the U.S. That's like much more common um, to have an elected school board. And the the what would in most places be called the superintendent is called the CEO of mm -hmm. Chicago Public Schools uh, and also is a mayoral appointee. Um, that's another one of those things. There's like so many little details like that that she includes as like, like we're gonna put that, I'm like, I'm going to include this and you can do with that information what you will. It is not my, it is not the thing that I'm gonna dwell on. Yeah. So we're gonna like keep moving. Um, but there is, uh, there's a ton of stuff like that in which the ways in which, uh, the forces of capitalism are driving a lot of these decisions. And so it is fascinating to me that the person who is in charge of the school district is uh, referred to as a CEO. Uh, uh, yeah, just just putting that out there. Um, but to the yep. history, to the, this point, uh, yeah, and, and also they went through several in like the period in question. So the, the, um, mm -hmm. the like during the, during the couple of years that most of this book is dealing with. Uh, Barbara Bird Bennett was was like the, 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 the was the CEO of Chicago Public Schools for the bulk of that time. Um, she is the one who is now incarcerated because she uh, in October of 2015 she was indicted on bribery charges for a plan in which she arranged no bid contracts from the school district to her former mentor and an employer in exchange for bribes. So um, that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, she was replaced. I think that's the that's the Airbnb guy. Anyway, so they had there was there was a lot of like 
changeover in that respect. There's also just like, I don't know, the degree to which Chicago is like famous and notorious for corruption mm -hmm. uh, and, and like people's attitudes towards that. That's something that is also like kind of glossed <laughs> over, but there's yeah. a bit where people are like, yeah, Rahm Emanuel is unacceptable because he's out here like it's like a gang, like a, a a gangster killing people in broad daylight as yeah. opposed to like quietly. Yeah, um, but so, you got to try to hide it, <laughs> right? Yeah, you got to at least try to hide it. Like you can be like corrupt, and like we expect you to be corrupt. Um, again, like the cynicism, but uh, but like what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> anyway, be good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, so history. Sorry, going off on. A lot of tangents here. Um, the I think one of the the things that she really like tries to get across is while like she's focusing on she rather deliberately chose a super super narrow. Like, she's not even talking about all of these school closings. She's very specifically talking about the school closings in Bronzeville. That is what like that's what her her specific area of focus is. But like you can extrapolate a lot from that in terms of like yes Chicago, but also just like all of the US, um, there's, there, there are a lot of parallels to be drawn. Um, and she draws them at a few points throughout. But uh, the one of the things, one of the like kind of recurring themes is the ways in which none of these school closures exist in a contemporary vacuum. The decisions that are being made by policymakers today are not just like random decisions that they arrived at today. Like they're, they are the consequence of the history of decisions being made by policymakers, and so any argument that like all of the the um, this goes back to again like the ways in which the at the hearings they were using the like as you put it the like bad grad student uh, yeah. like, description of numbers right like that that whole rhetorical style has a way of suggesting well as you can see you know we like ran the numbers on the 2013 test scores. And you know, this is how everybody yeah. scored on these 2013 tests. So this is the decision we have to make. Yeah. Uh, and like, even even if even if you assumed like that uh, any like any sort of imputed good faith towards that, uh, which she doesn't <laughs> for good reason, um, yeah. that is that's like on its face absurd, right? Because there is a whole history that like gets us to that moment in time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like one of the big parts of this history too that I think is really like for me coming at education policy with like very little understanding. I've always understood that like there I, I've understood for a while now like okay there's this connection between location and education and like there's I've generally understood that as like a property tax thing. I haven't understood how other parts of that policy can be important and she really connects it to the history of housing policy and like public houses in particular like everything down to like what kind of houses were being built like the choice to do like big high rises versus row houses she talks a lot um at one point about like how it, that created this huge influx of children to an area which is like why you had to build all of these schools or but like there's all this racist policy around i mean obviously racism and housing policy are hugely linked as well um and but so that creates like this one air like this pocket of like just full of children so they need all of these schools and then they like then we're like actually now we're not gonna have these like high races and so then there were it is like the the complete like i think a recurring like theme throughout this this book is like this the like the way that schools provide stability to a community and like that like that Biggest sources of instability already, and then it's driving further instabilities. Um, the way that like it's affecting the school policy as well. Um, you cut out a little bit, like right in the middle. Uh, okay. So schools are providing stability, and then I did yes. I did not hear what you said after that. <laughs> Got it. So schools providing stability, um, like is like the common theme, and then like creating these huge instabilities in housing are like then mirrored by like disrupting schools and like that's in, like affecting the community structure like that's which is another big part of this argument is the way that like schools are connected to your sense of community and which are also in turn connected to your sense of identity yeah and it's it's also um there's a lot there's a whole theme of like displacement of of mm -hmm. like 
officials, like government displacing its own people. Uh, and like that, like the schools are doing that, but like there's the immediate act of displacement that the the school closures represent, but it's like that those are also built on a whole history of that, right? Yeah. Like, this is like a thing that, that the city has been doing to the same people over mm -hmm. and over again, to like yeah. the same um, communities of like black, it's, it's the black and Latinx population in particular, but like, mm -hmm. uh, over and over again, um, displacing them. And so, yeah, that like the school closures become particularly loaded for that reason, because it's yeah. not just that you are displacing us, it's that you are displacing us yet again, and that you yeah. are disproportionately, dis but you're, you're claiming to do, to make this like big, far reaching decision. But like, once again, you are disproportionately displacing like this, the same, the same fucking community that you keep yeah. over and over again um, with, like with policies that like while less um uh maybe less explicitly racist than the idea of like you know not yeah. um like not leasing houses or not renting yes yes uh yeah then, then like neighborhood quotas and stuff like that that kind of thing um but it, it's still the the outcomes are still incredibly racist uh yeah. so, like, the uh yeah yeah and like another way that that like manifested just like on such like an individual level um in the morning section when to me like was really affecting was when she's talking about um the teachers and their response to to the like like they had been like their schools were shut down and they were just like i can't go through this again like i can't like this was like it was like a heartbreak. Like she compares it to like a romantic heartbreak, but it, it, it's, and it's like, feels even more intense to that and how that's like, like at least with a romantic heartbreak, most people will be able to eventually move on. This is something that is like even more traumatic and like than, than most heartbreaks are where a lot of these teachers are saying like, I don't like one teacher is like, I became a substitute teacher instead because I just couldn't like invest myself in a school again like that. And like, just to have it taken away, like, for me, right, because the thing because they're still beholden to Chicago public schools, right? So like yeah. unlike uh, unlike a like a, a normal heartbreak, right? Like you you your heart is broken by this other person, and then yeah. like you go away and you find another person who was like who their own complete completely new. Yeah. Person. But like the thing is that like both the teacher and the school, so now that school is gone, and like that's the thing that that's being mourned. But like you and your new school are still like subject yeah. to the same, you know, the, the same overarching authority that yeah. like you have, you have no stability. Um, again, going back to what you were saying, like that, like that, that, that as a kind of recurring theme that of schools as a source of stability, um, as a source of community and, and kinship. Um, that's yeah. also something she talks about quite a bit, uh, the ways in which schools create sort of like family and communal bonds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, the, the ways in which all of those things are also lost when when we close schools um uh to the the like the the racism of the rhetoric this is actually also a thing that i think is really great about the appendix another reason that i would highly recommend um checking out the appendix is she does have a whole sort of section about um she talks really quickly but about the idea of muted racism and that showing up in uh the, the three terms i'm now going to read off but deflection indexicality and omission and so deflection being um it's not racism it's something else entirely like it's, it has nothing to do with racism it's mm -hmm. about actually to the um the the example that you gave the, the way that i think a lot of people think about um educational disparities as being a property tax thing right so it's not it's not education it's class that's mm -hmm. the issue um so that's the deflection um indexicality that's more the like the neighborhood type thing that's like the idea that well you know like these these neighborhoods are just extreme like they're they are majority black and so like that just that just happens um it has yeah. something to do with racism um and then omission being just like not acknowledging that race even could have anything to do with it. Like, so not, not even to say it's not racism, it's this, it's just, um, I think the example that she gives is uh, a lot of, uh, if like high, if black boys are being expelled at high rates, mm -hmm. um, making it about 
uh, behavior problems. And so like yeah. never, never address, never even presenting racism as a like possible explanation. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's like, it's like a page of the appendix, but I think it's like super, super useful. Uh, yeah. Would highly recommend. <laughs> yeah. <Again. laughs> um, I guess while I, I don't know. So there's like rhetoric. This is one of the problems of making the outline a mess. <laughs> Where, where, where go? Where should I go? Um, but the, I guess the rhetoric and the judging of school stuff is like very much intertwined. Um, I, I, she spends a lot of time in this book talking about like just the idea of like a failing school and what it means to call a school failing and, and like the ways in which the community like the communities don't think of these schools that way, right? Yeah. And so, and like, I think a, a question, a guiding question that she keeps sort of referring back to is like, why why would anyone fight to save a failing school? And like, the answer to that question in part is that like, it's it's not, um, or that it is clearly, it is clearly only failing by one metric and that it is clearly not failing by the the metrics, like the, the guides that the community is using. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, a lot of that section, well, so if this is not a critique of the book, but I would love like an extended exploration of like, because in, in that, so there's one, that one section in particular where she's using that critical discourse analysis um, to, to separate between the different ways that these different groups are approaching the topic of mm -hmm. like, you know, there's this one group that is clearly like approaching this with a lot of power and using also like a faulty use of statistics and stuff like that to, to make things work. And then, um, contrasting that with the community who does not have power in this situation, but is like explicitly laying out what the value is of these schools to them, why these schools are not failing to them. And like, those are things that are not going to be quantifiable. They're really about like relationships and identity. And like, those are things that are not going to be captured in those statistics. Mm -hmm. I would love like, and, and maybe this is like in the references. And so that's what I need to go to. Um, but the exploration of what those statistics are that were being used and like, what yeah how are they used like I assume that they are pretty bad like and I, I think one thing she kind of talks about is our our increasing love in education policy of using like a single value to like quantify educational experiences so that we can make these kind of policy choices and so I don't know that it's necessarily in the scope of this book that is specifically talking about um these specific closings but I would love like a discussion or like a book that is about what these different policy like what these different quantities are that people are using in this way and like this really simplified um kind of way she did, yeah, I, I I I would agree that in general that it yes, it's like it's outside the scope. Um the she talks, she does, she cites um a couple other uh, other academics talking about um testing, test scores, mm -hmm. like the ways in which we use test yep. scores to rank schools. Um I I also I like flagged uh, mm -hmm. while you were talking the thing that I opened I was like the bibliography because that was like I had starred um, a couple things specifically as like something that I wanted to the the one that I starred with regards to that uh, is a book called Engines of Anxiety Academic Rankings mm. Reputation and Accountability. What so, a great title! Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, <laughs> that is so like I feel like I've learned everything <laughs> from the title. They really like laid it out for you. you yeah. Know? It's, uh, that's so uh, that's what it is yeah um but yeah and and the the like yes i agree that i think that that is something that like um i understand why it is not included quite why she doesn't dwell on it so much in the context of this work specifically but i do think that that is something that is important to understand um in terms of like the broader context of of all of this is is mm -hmm. the there is also a really complicated and uh, I don't know, there's also like a lot of racism in the structure of the the tests that are used yeah. to, like to reduce schools to these kind of like, here's a number and that's how we're gonna define a school. Um, and I think she does, she, she spends less time on that, but I do think she spends, uh, she spends less time on that because she is more interested in talking about the other side of that, Definitely. which is, 
the idea that like these numbers are not everything that a school is um, and kind of jumping way ahead to my uh, capitalism is garbage yeah. <laughs> uh, subheading. Um, yeah. But like the, like, I, I think she doesn't dwell on this question of the numbers because she introduces them mostly to just say that they are coming from a place of neoliberal values of efficiency and yeah. markets and yeah. why the fuck are efficiency and markets the metrics for a school like that's yeah. not like that, that that's insane like that, that that's yeah. absurd to suggest um that like that that is that that is the way that we should be treating and and measuring and valuing a school like it, its goals are not efficiency um the consumer consumers such as they yeah. are in a school uh it, it's like vastly more complicated than <laughs> my decisions at the grocery store yeah. or whatever like it, it's just not um it's just like a really terrible way to to yeah. be in evaluating schools but we take that it, it is like that rhetoric that language is so embedded in american society that people just take it for granted yeah so the values that we should be appreciating yeah fucking elementary school no <laughs> no <laughs> that's actually so like even though i said like i would have wanted that discussion i'm also glad she didn't put it in there because in a way i feel like what she was doing was saying like it was the school's responsibility to justify or like not the school sorry the um the the, the public school system's yeah. responsibility to to explain why these numbers should be important and they failed to do that and also mm -hmm. i felt like she was giving more like I don't know, effect to what the community was saying then by focusing on their response and what it means in contrast to what the school district was saying without like say, like without quibbling about what is clearly a bad faith argument from mm -hmm. these people. Like why would you argue with that when they're not even presenting their data in a way that suggests that they actually care about the community? Yeah. I yeah, I love that. I yes, I, I totally agree. I think yes, that there, that there is like that there is something um, really rhetorically deliberate about that decision. Just like, we're, I'm not gonna dwell. I'm gonna like, we're gonna quickly like lay out what's happening here that like yep. test scores and, and like those kinds of things are, that's loosely where they're getting these numbers from. Here's five other academics you can go read talking about why that's bullshit. Um, yep. And I'm gonna move on because what I'm more interested in here is the community's response. Like I like the, the, the district didn't argue this. It's not my job. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lay this argument out because no, like that's I that's that is yeah. not the voice or the perspective um that she was trying to represent here anyway. Yep. So yeah. yeah. Yes. Um to continue my capitalism is garbage. <laughs> uh, Go for it. This, this <laughs> is like a big part of the the um the unspoken like driver for the city is that in in addition to while all of these schools were being closed, they were also creating a ton of contracts for charter schools. Mm -hmm. Um and so like turning these schools over from like publicly run entities to uh, privately run privatizing education in effect um, in and like uh, also basically expediting the gentrification of these neighborhoods. This is another thing that she that like comes that came up a lot in like the community protest too, where like the, the community was like, we, we know what you're doing here. And what you're doing is you're trying to get us to leave this yeah. area so that one, we can be gone and you can like level our homes and turn them into like bougie condos or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. So, so yes, there's yeah. a, a, like just a lot of, a lot of layers, a lot yeah. of layers of that going on. And this on. is like another thing I really appreciate about the history stuff that she brought up was she talked a lot about naming schools, which I thought was really important. Sure. If I'm cutting out right now. You are cutting out to re to repeat. I believe you just said the na okay. name the names of schools. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and like specific historical figures, like you know the the first doctor to do open heart surgery. I think that was the Williams School. Um, there's yeah, like uh, there's the music teacher who like right now I'm blinking on the name, um, but he was like super important to the community, like super important like. In, in the world and history of music, but it was also important to the community. And like, there's a school named after him. Um, 
Diet. Mm. Is that what was that one? Diet. The music. The music. Yes. The music, yeah. Yeah. The music teacher yes. was Diet. Yeah yeah yeah. 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 Um. And so I thought that was like, like very effective and like very clear because there's like a clear example of like the gentrification involved in all of this where one of the charter schools that's going to be, or like, no, sorry, it was a public school, I think, but like that was going to be replacing the other school was like gonna be named after like a 19th century hotel magnet. And you're like, why? Like, who cares? <laughs> like, well, and also, also one of the, one of the schools, I didn't entirely understand this section, uh, but there was a, she was talking uh, about how I, I didn't fully understand this because it was embedded in community testimony. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, uh, one of the hearings, somebody was talking about how uh, uh, we kind of glossed over this with the rhetoric. But the, the the things, the two things that the the district that CPS kept repeating was the idea that the schools that they were closing are underutilized and under resourced. Which will I'm going to put a pin in this. We're going to come yeah. back to that. But um, underutilized, under resourced. And at one of the public hearings, somebody was talking about how like the they're they're not using all the resources and there's like an elevator that they don't have access to because there's a charter school i what i understood uh, maybe as the case was that there's a charter school on the same site and so what they're saying is like like that's she was saying something that something that uh she was trying to correct something that the that cps was arguing about their utilization um yeah. and she kept saying like we don't have access to that it's like the thing that you're saying we're not using is because it's not for us yeah it's for the charter school um that i think maybe exists on the same site this i don't yeah. I, I don't i didn't entirely follow this i do know um from like like lausd examples that that's like a thing that that sometimes happens where you like um, you have kind of hybrid hybrid use um uh, interesting situations um and so that it, that was my my like loose understanding but again like goes back to the, this like the gentrification questions right so like there's they have this other this other use in mind yeah uh, <laughs> and so like if you could just yeah you know, uh that would fix all our problems yeah it, it's so cynical <laughs> like it's just so i i feel like that's such a naive thing to say too at this point where you're just like gentrification is cynical public education policy is cynical but like i it's like seeing it all like laid out with like these kinds of specifics it's just like ugh. Like it just reminds you of like yeah. the many different ways, like the specific ways that the cynicism yeah. plays out. Um, yes, uh, specifically so going under resourced, underutilized, right? So yeah. those are those are their their big like watch words. Which is the most cynical part of this. <laughs> so like, in, like infuriating. You can tell yeah. that this is also the 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 thing that drove Ewing nuts too. Yeah. Uh, but like it's just every time that she talks about uh Barbara Bird Bennett describing these schools as under resourced is like a like what the fuck you yeah. are in charge of the resources yeah That's your job yeah it's your job to allocate the resources so if we are under resourced at our school yeah. that's that's you like that is your failure that is not our that's failure not yeah failed that's because you failed to provide the resources yeah <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't like what are you saying uh, yeah <sighs> like what does underutilized even mean like one of those kids like brings that up too like where they're like but we use the school like well yeah so what is like what are you talking about she, yeah. that that is one of the few terms that she did that i, I ewing i do feel like she she sufficient like introduced so that is that's here they talk about uh they do give a, a percentage again th they don't explain why these numbers should matter is the problem um but they they say they give a, a yeah. percentage a usage percentage let, let's say it's a, a 85 percent. i don't remember the exact number but let's say that utilization is uh 85 that the goal your goal is 85 percent with like plus or minus i don't know 10. um again these are made up numbers yeah. i don't 
the actual numbers because it doesn't matter. Uh, but so if your goal is 85% plus or minus 10, you're in, in your desired range. Um, and specifically, they base it on the number of like designated homerooms. Like there are so many layers of classification going on here that yeah. are not justified or explained. But so then you say, okay, based on the number of designated homerooms. Um, and so if there's, so then like the, based on that, there's like 35 homerooms at this school. Therefore, that 85% number would be like 600. And you can go, now I have to do math. I'm not <laughs> 550 to 650. That's not the right math, but that's, yeah. and then that's our range. And this school is at 400. Therefore, um, it's underutilized. Uh, and there's a lot of, it's like a lot of, um, it feels like just really lazy theatrics, right? Yeah. So like that whole explanation that I gave, the numbers were different. Um, and like, I'm like paraphrasing, but that is that is that is an excerpt of test of like uh, CPS testimony at one of these hearings. Like, uh, uh, like this is essentially something that some official got up in front of a room full of concerned parents and said that shit. And yeah. it ends up feeling like, just a lot of like weird rhetorical manipulation that like see now you're as you can see because of all these numbers and figures yeah. that I've presented to you and the statistical model and uh yep. whatever underutilized school yeah <laughs> gotta get that efficiency uh-huh 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 gotta mm. do the numbers yeah i don't yeah yeah i feel like another like thing that keeps coming up in our discussions is that idea of like people trying to look for a singular like idea or thing to like solve the thing um which weirdly does also trace back to dreamland um but like <laughs> this is like this is like the point at dreamland where i was both like i see where you're going and i hate where you took it but like i do think like there's like that is a part of this book as well like this idea of turning to like to metrics to answer questions that you're not going to always be able to solve with metrics like that's something in superior to like that like we're we're using number we like the the fetishization of numbers to like explain our world is like it's it becomes a problem like it's not just a question of like bad methodology it's a matter of bad policy and like i mean i say this as someone who like appreciates numbers i like data but like our our, our assessment of data is only as good as us and like this is a case where the numbers are being wielded in a really dangerous and like horrific way like it's really disrupting people's lives it's really making like their education harder it's making like communities feel completely destabilized like it's yeah it's yeah yep. <laughs> just like turning to that single number yeah and like that's part of what i like about this book too is like it like connected to that methodology like she is like not relying on single metric she is really like she is using data but she's using data to tell a story she's not using data like in a to to like i was gonna say to prove a point which is not the right way to say this but she's not single or she's not centering all of her points around a singular point of data it's like really more of a holistic picture i guess she describes the uh, other ways of knowing is the the mm -hmm. phrase that she uses a couple times in right about like yeah. that, yes you're you've that the that cps is coming to these conversations with this here's our six tables and these are this is what we use this is the the rubric um we will not deviate from this rubric yeah mostly because this rubric proves that we can do the thing we want to do anyway for several yeah. reasons but uh but yeah but like basically saying that like all of this is at the expense of other ways of knowing um and she talks about uh again like the like it's going to be like larger um uh, uh, educational policy like perspective on this but she talks briefly too about how she went to like went to school districts where schools were run in like different ways and she talks about a school in i think california where um uh, mm -hmm. like a native community and how they had like yeah a, an elder in the classroom who was helping 
with like mastering yeah. in some capacity. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I, I think yep. the point being that there are that there are lots of other ways that you like we can and should be evaluating and thinking about schools and about education and um like if the if the ways that we are thinking about this like and again to even assume the best of faith if the ways which i think like i i would not impute any sort of good faith into uh any of the like major cps officials involved yeah you think though that like the the language that they use um is repeated by people in earnest like who, yeah who, who like who do view themselves as like approaching this in in good faith yeah. um and and like and like that's that's really i think also very much a part of the problem is that like that that language um getting reused and, and repeated and i think that like a a core question that she, one of many questions that she is asking of people in in this book though is to say that like if so even if we assume the best of 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 intentions with the logic that you are using if that logic is dis is having consequences that are disproportionately of like mm -hmm. harming um certain groups of people then at a certain point like you need to rethink that logic right yeah like, you need to start asking yourself some questions about that logic and about those arguments yeah and also like you can't like like she's specifically talks about like them trying to evade the question of whether or not it's racist and she's like you cannot like you can't do that like <laughs> this is racist like she's not gonna like argue it she's just gonna like she or i mean she does argue like she does point out like this is based on them like and not when i say them i mean like the way a lot of people approach discussions of racism of like defining it as like a personal like mm -hmm. attribute rather than a systemic thing um and like she's trying to like she's saying like look at like and she's not just saying it herself she's also pointing to the way that the community is pointing it out like and how they've been treated and how they're being affected disproportionately by these policies like these are like you like you can't just number your way like even if you actually like if you do use the numbers like, they they show you like Right. This is so one of the one of the quotes from the book that I added to our, our little docs from page 91. But uh, mm -hmm. she writes, uh, they were racist because they were the culmination of several generations of racist policy stacked mm -hmm. on racist policy, each one disregarding, controlling and displacing black children and families in new ways layered upon the callousness of the last. Um, and yeah, it, that feels like it's that that is a, a point that she is driving at like repeatedly and over and over again and coming at from like several different directions. But like uh, that, yeah, if if the outcome, it doesn't really matter if like you have racism in your heart, like that's that's that that is not it. Like the outcome yeah. is still racist. So like, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and operating in an institution in a system that is and has been racist. So yeah. like. Uh, that excuse doesn't cut it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, um, okay, well, I don't feel like we touched on all the things in the doc, but I feel like we did and we did like mostly because we have exclamation points in the doc. So I'm like, did we do enough exclamation points? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully. Um, but yeah, there's um, I'm trying to see if there's like anything I felt like we didn't get to get to say um yeah i feel like i feel like so we talked about a lot of stuff in this hour that she probably would have been able to lay out like a whole second dissertation during right like <laughs> her correct uh, again the efficiency of this book i'm just so yeah i mean something that we talked about previously but um feels it feels incredibly <laughs> superfluous to include now but um we talked about how we were gonna like end these chats by asking whether or not we liked it <laughs> yes so, okay did you like that? i really like this book <laughs> it's so good my only like like yeah i was gonna say like i feel bad that i can't write it Like, I don't know. It feels like a black one. That is my own personal failing. Um, I also feel like I cut out. And so that is my out for like 
no one has to hear the stupid thing I, I just no, said. I have no idea what you just said. So what I heard about, stupid. Your Don't worry. own personal failing is between you and your internet connection. Oh, I'm so glad. Cool. Uh, <laughs> that's all the, I heard you cut out. And then I just heard, that's my own personal failing. So. Yeah. Okay. I'll just uh, cop to it. It's just the jealousy that like I could not write so efficiently. But that is that is a thing on my end. That is my, my <laughs> personal failing again. Um, I didn't want to like leave people hanging on what I think my feelings are. Nicole, did you like this book? Yeah, I I, <laughs> I really I I thought it was fantastic. I would highly recommend it. Um, I also think I think that is part of why I struggled a little bit to try to like like how do we drill all of this down? I think we talked um, previously about the ways in which a like nonfiction discussion like this is the kind of thing that you theoretically don't have to have have read to like we can talk about like the ideas that are present um yeah. but I, like a, you should read it you should read it please yeah. read this book yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 is this really right. the best. it's really interesting and especially if you're like me and you're trying to define sociology i don't know that this is like defining sociology but it's like helping me build my understanding to like okay this is like this is how it, how it gets done. This is what the work is. Um, because I find that like a lot, like I have gone to the Wikipedia entry for sociology like 50 times at this point and I'm still kind of like, <laughs> mm. um, but like this was like much more <laughs> helpful <laughs> to like understanding, I think. Seeing okay. it in action. Yeah, uh, yeah. The action is where it's all at. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, well then, we have a, a lively. We didn't really have much of a, of a chat. I don't know. Yeah, but but fewer people watching. Fewer people, fewer people were with us this time. Yeah. Um, if you're here, you can say hello. But otherwise, yeah. Next next time. Yes. So our our next book is going to be I Contain Multitudes by Ed Young. I should probably center that more. Um, this is a book that I've had on my shelves for so long, and it's really getting embarrassing um, because I've been wanting to read it for a really long time. Um, but it's about microbes and it's about the microbiome. Um, and I like microbes a lot. I write about them a lot. So that's part of why I'm excited. But also Ed Young is been one of my favorite science writers for a long time. Um, and right now, especially, I think he's been getting a lot of attention because he's been writing a lot of really um, in-depth, useful articles about the pandemic. So if you are looking for some like like useful reference points for like understanding some of the science of what's going on right now, he's like a helpful person to start with. Um, and he's been really good also about sharing other science writers who have been helping him understand. So like he's not just like in it for himself, like he's very good at also raising awareness of like other science writers, which I really appreciate it because it always helps to know more um, useful people to follow. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, the point is that I'm really excited to talk about it. I'm excited to finally read this book and I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, join us on September 12th at yes. 5 p.m. Eastern time. Over on my channel on Okie Dokie Boki. Should I put the book in the thing? Yeah. I Next book. Van <laughs> Van says, I have a PhD in sociology. I teach sociology in colleges and I still don't totally know how to describe it. Oh, um, I'm so. <laughs> that's why I love your avatar. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yes. I feel so much relief <laughs> that. I think this is like the scope of things that can encompass it. Uh, yeah. Is, is, yeah. I think at the end of the each going forward, we're gonna have like a Deboki tries to describe sociology <laughs> based on this book. <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad. But well, another uh, recurring theme. Good. Yeah. No. Um, but I think that's it. So yeah. thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you haven't read this book, please read it. And uh, join us in a month when we're talking about I Contain Multitudes by Ed Young, which I'm excited um, to have, to like have, because that cover is good. That's yeah, like, it's... It looks cool. Um, so just like as an aesthetic object, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pleased to welcome that into my home. Yeah. And if you like microscopes, aesthetics, watch Journey to the Microcosmos on YouTube. <laughs> 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 Uh, what a comment right. Um all of that. Okay, I'm done. Uh bye. <laughs>